so there's an awful lot of uncertainty coming from that. And so that means, you know, those big forces that have been sort of dormant for a while suddenly move big. And so each of these I could analyze here right now, one of them at a time. Uh, the bigger problem is when they happen all at once. And so we know from uh, engineering models, you know, uh, uh, natural models like bio biology models uh, or economic models, when you have relationships between things that are moving, if the movements are nonlinear, uh, they interact in very surprising ways. And the, the mathematics behind that idea is called the mathematics of chaos. And they call it chaos because the outcomes are chaotic, completely inexplicable, even if you think you understand how things happen. So for instance, we understand why an airplane flies, right, the curved wing, the Bernoulli principle, blah, blah, blah. But we can't explain why when the air is perfectly clear and you're midway across the Atlantic, all of a sudden you get 15 minutes of hard turbulence and it's clear air turbulence. And the explanation is the nonlinearities are interacting in completely unpredictable ways. Or a person who uh, is perfectly fit, a marathon runner, uh, suddenly dies, and when they check, is, there's, there's no physiological reason. Uh, but then they think, hang on, that person was diagnosed with PTSD four years ago, and they believe then there's a deeper interaction. His death would be cons considered a black swan, an inexplicable event, and yet the underlying causality in between them is not understood. So it's that thing I'm appealing to here, is these things all move at once. They'll produce unmeasurable volatility the kinds of things that would explain today, I would explain the Victorian Depression or the global financial crisis with, from these deeper reasons, not, not because, you know, stock market went down or the, you know, the housing market went down. You know, that, that's what our superficial reasons are more like catalysts. Well, so what, the, what is the actual question you're supposed to ask is, should I be prepared for a recession? in the next year or two? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. It's like, you know, 40% chance of rain, do you take your umbrella? I don't know, do you, you don't cancel your tea time, right? But you might, <laughs> you might make sure you got the umbrella on your back. And, and so, so you're, more, you're prepared. And so whether you're an investment manager or a firm you know, operating uh, in, uh, in the real economy, Either way, you need to prepare yourself for a wider range of possibilities because of this volatility call I'm making. And it's not just in your mind knowing what you might do if something bad happens. It's actually actively managing risks when they arise so that you convert those risks to value. Okay, that's so, like, just as you might look at volatility this week and think, yeah, baby, finally, some good volatility. <laughs> you know, we're going we're gonna to get some value out of this, right? Yeah. Well, that's one way to look at it. It's the same way you would look at it as a firm uh, that's trying to sell stuff to people. You say, well, this, this is a lot of volatility. If I'm more ready for it than my competitor, I can take them out. You know, it's, it's a, it's, it gives you a competitive edge if you manage risks better than somebody else. And I think shareholders will recognize it. When I think of a central bank digital currency, I just think of banknotes. Uh, but in a digital form, in a little smart card, or perhaps on your phone, whatever uh, method works for you, and they're issued by a central bank instead of by some private provider, okay? So it's the central bank's responsibility to provide you with whatever means of payment you prefer to use. And right now, probably everybody here has got a, a few dollars at least in banknotes on them. Is anybody here with zero cash? See, this number is growing. Okay, so it means that, you know, I'm assuming since you're one of your Pender Fund client, you're not penniless. It's just you chose, you chose that, right? So the point is people are, by choice, will move in this direction. And as that happens, central banks are almost ready now to launch digital currencies. So they will. They need uh, some clearing up of legislation and that kind of thing in Canada. The Bank of Canada is actually only licensed to print bank notes, not to issue other forms of money, such as digital form. 
So we have to change the Bank of Canada's founding legislation to give them permission. But they're getting it all ready, so it'll come off the shelf whenever people, when you see a critical mass of people that want to want to do their payments that way. And so we've been clear about that throughout. It means that if you're, if you're putting together a private solution, which is fast payments based, you have to be uh, cognizant of two things. The central banks will issue one someday. That could be a big disruptor to your business model. It's, you know, people aren't going to use some, you know, Canadian tire money when there's real money. And secondly, uh, fast payments will have real-time settlement in our normal interact system uh, later this year, early next. So again, the value proposition of a digital, digital payments system is eroded substantially. So you have to be adding, you know, adding value some other way. So it's coming. Uh, what are the opportunities? It's just more efficiency, right? It's just it's ease of use. It's what people prefer. Central banks are all mandated to provide people with whatever it is they prefer to conduct their payments. So they will.